Hello everyone, we have learned about mole concept and the basic mole calculation before. Today, we will be looking at an extension of the application of mole concept which is identifying of limiting reactant in a chemical reaction. This will help us do more advanced chemical calculation. So what will we learn today? We will learn first what is a limiting reactant, why we need to identify the limiting reactant, and lastly, we will teach you how to identify them. Throughout this series of videos, we will be using real-life examples and analogy to help you understand the concept on limiting reactant before heading on to carry out chemical calculation using actual questions. Firstly, let us look at what a limiting reactant is. Let's take a scenario where I will need to wash a dirty old red car. However, if I only have one tablespoon of soap powder, how am I supposed to wash this dirty old car? It is quite impossible to wash the entire car with just one tablespoon of soap. Am I right? Soap is not enough to remove all the dirt from my, my car. As such, I'm saying that there is insufficient soap for me and in chemistry term, for a chemist, they will say that soap is the limiting reactant to the process of cleaning my car. So why do we need to identify the limiting reactant for the, a chemical reaction? For most of the chemical reaction that take place, there are usually two or more reactants reacting together to form products. So for example, A reacts with B will produce C. So it's very important that we identify the limiting reactant. As the amount of product form in a reaction is always determined by the amount of the limiting reactant available. What do I mean by this? Now let's take an example. Say for example, Johnny wanted to make sandwiches for himself and his friends in school one day. Okay? In order to make one sandwich, he requires two slices of bread and one piece of ham. And that's how he can make one sandwich. So, in chemistry perspective, the slice of bread and ham will be the reactant, while the sandwich will be the product. Also, the ratio of the bread to ham to product will be 2 is to 1 is to 1. Okay, as he looked through the kitchen, he realized that he only had 10 pieces of bread and 10 pieces of ham. So with this number of ham and bread, let's take some time to think about these two things. How many sandwiches can he make in total? Which of these two ingredients is re preventing him from making more sandwiches and which is in excess? If your answer was 5 sandwiches, then you are absolutely correct. Why is this so? First, let us look at the total number of sandwiches that can be made using individual ingredients. With 10 slices of ham, he can make 10 sandwiches. But in order for him to do that, he requires 20 slices of bread, which is not enough. He is limited by the 10 slices of bread that he has. And with the 10 slices of bread, he could make a maximum of 5 sandwiches as each sandwich will require 2 slices of bread. However, putting the two ingredients together, Johnny will not be able to make 10 sandwiches as there will be a shortage of bread and as such, he, can, he will only be able to make 5 sandwiches. That will leave him with 5 pieces of ham as leftovers as you can see. Since the bread is a limiting reactant, all 10 slices of bread are used up to make the 5 sandwiches. Only 5 pieces of ham are used to make the 5 sandwiches. That gives us 5 pieces of ham in excess. Hence, in this scenario, the slice of bread will be the limiting reactant. Okay, as it is the reactant that is completely used up. So how do we identify a limiting reactant? We look for the reactant that will completely be used up in the reaction. 
This is called a limiting reactant because it determines or limits the amount of product formed, which is in this case, the slice of bread has limited the total number of sandwiches to make the five sandwiches only. The reactants that are not used up are called the excess reactants. Now let us look at another example. This time, you will carry out the necessary calculation in the worksheet given to you. Okay, how many cars can be made if I have 20 tyres and 14 headlights? Okay, what do you do for the first step? You first identify the ratio of each reactant. In this case, it's the ratio between the tyres and headlights, and therefore the product form which is a car. Step 2, you identify which reactant or which component, whether is it the tyre or the headlights, they are in excess and which is limiting the numbers of cars to be made. So step 1, in order for us to assemble a car, 4 tyres and 2 headlights are needed. In this example, imagine that the tyres and headlights are reactant while the cars in the pro is a product form from the reaction between 4 tyres and 2 headlights. I will have a ratio of 2 is to 4 and is to 1. If you have 20 tyres and 14 headlights, how many cars can you make? Okay, you, you may want to think about this additional question. Which of the components are completely used up, which is a limiting react reactant? And which of the components are left over, which is in excess? And I hope that you will be able to get your answer. Okay, let us take a look at the answer. If your answer is five cars, then you are right. But if you did not get the answers correctly, then you may want to look through this video again to understand the concept on limiting reactant again.